been a long time since I pampered myself in such a luxury vehicle. All the features, technology, are world class. Let's take a look at the new Mercedes E53 AMG. So let's start by saying this 2020 E53 with the AMG package starts at about $74,000. That is not too bad, but when you spec this thing out the way that this car is, it's $97,000. Now there's some pretty heavy hitter packages on here, like the Burmeister high-end 3D audio system, which is $4,500. So I'll start with that. When you get in here and you listen to Bluetooth audio, it's not good at all. It sounds like a regular run-of-the-mill audio system. So that means you have to go to either lossless audio over USB or Android Auto or Apple CarPlay. Now, both of those sound much better, with the exception that to change the audio settings to the 3D audio, the VIP front setting or passenger, you have to exit out, stop the music that's playing, go through a series of menus to change all of that and it's one of the most frustrating experiences you're ever going to get into. One of the primary reasons you're buying a car like this is to enjoy luxury audio, and it is so half-baked in the user experience that it is agonizing. And I'm gonna get more into the technology now. There are two enormous screens that just look like a giant tablet strewn across the dashboard. This has to be one of the best pieces of software in the auto industry. It looks good, the black levels are satisfactory at night. It's not overly bright. It's legible. You have three different configurations for your gauge cluster, basically one, two, or three. One is a traditional layout, one is a sporty layout, and the other one is progressive for all those people that like the futuristic look and feel. Now, once you change that, it changes the interior ambient lighting. It changes the way that the infotainment somewhat looks, but the way that all the software and the graphical user interface is, is amazing. Now what really kills all this wonderful software implementation is the HMI or human machine interface and it feels like to me there was an internal struggle on what they wanted to do. So they said let's do everything. When you look at the steering wheel you have these two Blackberry style capacitive buttons that you can kind of swipe left or right or up or down and the left side of the steering wheel controls the center gauge cluster. However the right side controls the infotainment which when you look at how the center gauge cluster is split up left and right, it's not all that intuitive. You wanna control the right side with your right hand, but then it messes with the infotainment. So let's speak about how you control the infotainment for a minute. So either the right side of the steering wheel, this touchpad thing on the center armrest that you rest your hand on, or the rotary command knob underneath. So you have three ways to control the same thing and you don't have a touch screen. And in some cases I find like it's so agonizingly difficult to try to figure out what it is I want to do, what control structure I want to use that I want to touch the screen and then that doesn't work. You might as well just throw that in there to make it even worse. But the main thing to say is I can't imagine the demographic of person buying this car is going to be very excited about all this. It is very difficult to figure out and use every single day. But the main thing is this interior space. It just doesn't feel all that special for $96,000. The plastics, the leathers, it seems like pretty much what every mainstream manufacturer is doing. So if you're looking for something that is more boutique or handmade, you have to go to the E63 or the S-Class to get that interior. Now the seating comfort is top notch in here. The adjustability is ridiculous. You can be huge, you can be small and fit, including the back seats. They are usable for a smaller adult and you get your own back windows as well. So it makes it a more usable car for a two-door at least. 
the trunk the trunk space for a coupe is good and you have ski pass throughs if you plan on bunny jumping anywhere now let's get on to some of the negatives again there's too much gloss black this entire center stack area is covered in it it's all scratched up and this looks like a mainstream interior it looks very very cheap now they make up for it like the way that the vents feel the way that there's this metalized trim around the corner and the way that it is ambient lit at night it is classy it looks very nice and it trails all the way across into the doors for the Burme burmeister audio grills it has a aluminum or metal alloy grill it just it flows very cohesively and the dash the dash design is very compact and small and it's nice it doesn't feel like this huge slab that takes up a ton of space unnecessarily and that's what gives you more room in this interior now the last thing to talk about is some of the technology that is just a gimmick i'll be completely honest it's here for the sake of it to make you feel like your money is worth spending so when you go into the infotainment and you go into the settings or the vehicle settings you get to this energizing comfort menu which has all these presets like refresh, warmth, vitality, and enjoyment. And when you drill down into the submenus, it will activate the air freshener, intensive seat ventilation, and massage. And one of the cheesiest parts is when you hit to start it, after about five minutes of that, if I had hair, I would have pulled it out. It's by far the most annoying, cheesiest thing I've ever heard, but there's gotta be somebody that thinks it's amazing, otherwise it wouldn't be here. Right down to the air freshener, which has a crafty name like Daybreak Mood, either something out of Twilight or something they bought up from the old Britney Spears perfume collection from Walmart. It reeks. It gives me a headache instantaneously. Now, I feel like this is a great idea. They could really expand upon this, maybe put multi-fragrances in, using essential oil, something that's not chemical-based. But again, we're talking about luxury stuff here. And, you know, it's all up to the buyer what they value and if they think this is good or bad. But let's take this into the shop and talk about all the mechanical things that you want to know about. Welcome to Germany. We are under the Mercedes E-Class, Jack. This architecture is called MRA. It was updated in 2017 for the E-Class. The C and the S-Class are on this architecture. The Coupe, in this case, the E53 AMG, is slightly lower than the sedan. But most notably, when they went to the new W123 body style, which this is, they shaved 200 pounds off the prior generation E-Class. Their objective for designing this car was to build a GT, really GT sports car, not a dedicated sports car. Its whole purpose is to isolate the driver as much as possible while sprinkling, sprinkling in that little bit of fun. Okay. So... When we look at the underbody, the big question is, when you start to get into this price category, $75,000 plus, in this case, almost hundred grand, you want to know where the differences are. And that's where at least Mercedes separates itself from some of the more budget cars. Like, and I'm going to talk about this specifically. When you look at like a Honda, a Subaru, a Kia, some of your basic Ford products underneath, you do not see this level of diversity in materials. You don't see the use of sealers and the careful use of underbody coating. So let's start in the front. Plastic panels, plastic coverings, skid plates. The next part that's super important on the front of this is you have an aluminum subframe carrier. This is not something that you see on normal cars. Now the aluminum subframe or a subframe carrier is responsible for holding all the suspension components together and bolting up to the body. So when you have an aluminum piece, it saves weight, it's more rigid, and this is all aluminum suspension components, forged aluminum arms, your carrier or your hub knuckle design is also aluminum. And in the case of this Mercedes, you get half air ride. So it's an air spring assembly with an AMG damper that has an external piggyback canister for extra oil flow. So that can help with compression. It can smooth out ride quality and you have the control unit. Now granted, this is all more expensive. Of course, this is why you're paying that extra money. And then when we move towards the back of the car, or even in the middle, like even the exhaust hanger here, this is something that has just a little bit of adjustability to move the ex exhaust inward and outward, and the bushing that's there is not something that you would typically see 
it's a more expensive solution than just a rubber band hanger. And that's this whole car, right? When you look at this, people ask, what are you getting for $75,000 starting? You're getting a raised engineering budget. Everything they did in this car, yes, there are some compromises. For example, the rear subframe is steel, but to get around that, they covered it up and they used an epoxy sealer of some sort. Yeah, and that's something when we look at new cars, you'll typically see subframe or steel pieces rotting out already or, or surface rust building on there. So they do, they go the extra mile to, to seal all their steel parts so you don't get the corrosion, you don't get the rust. So this is going to last longer if you're somewhere like us where there's salt. That's an extra cost built into it. Now, everything in the back, again, all your control arms are aluminum. You have an AMG rear differential, a clutch-based differential. So it's very cool to see this and you start to understand, yes, the interior might be gimmicky, some of that stuff that you see on every cars, but when you get to the core mechanical engineering. This yes. is where your money is going. Let's take a look at the engine bay. So we're looking at Mercedes's new inline six, dubbed the M256. It is a single large turbocharger, a twin scroll unit, attached to a mild hybrid system. There is both an electric supercharger and a ISG, a integrated starter motor, which alone produces almost 180 foot pounds of torque and 29 horsepower. This all comes together to produce 429 horsepower and 380 foot pounds of torque. And that's all fed through a nine speed automatic trans attached to Mercedes all wheel drive system, which is very similar to xDrive being rear wheel drive biased. I am excited about this. I'm excited about it because it is crazy. Yeah, it's super complicated. It's super complicated. It's very interesting. And this is what the, in the modern age of vehicles, they're calling a mild hybrid setup. Manufacturers like BMW, Audi, and Mercedes are going to this setup where they use a full 48 volt charging system. And this is all possible because they've added a lithium ion battery here to handle some of the things that accessory dry belts and traditional alternators used to do. So brake regeneration through the electric motor is able to ch charge the lithium ion battery, which that lithium ion battery powers the ISG, which is an integrated starter generator that is sandwiched between the transmission and the motor. And this is very similar to how Honda's old, old school hybrid system used to work. And what this does is it spins up the motor at a dead stop. So this is how the start stop system works. So you have an electric motor, you don't have that constant starter noise and you don't have the vibration because that electric motor is so capable and it produces so much power, it's, it's so smooth. And then it's coupled to these active motor mounts which reduce a ton of vibration. So this is one of the smoothest stop start systems you'll ever experience. So that electric motor is also capable of giving the engine or taking away parasitic losses and creating horsepower, correct? Yes, so the way the system works is the ISG takes over when the motor is being started from a dead stop. Then the electric supercharger kicks on to get rid of any of the initial turbo lag of having a larger turbocharger. So you get up to like eight or nine foot pounds of boost from the electric supercharger. So there's two electric motors technically, so you know, the one sandwiched in between the engine and transmission, which starts and stops, gets the thing going, and there's a separate electric supercharger, which is essentially a turbo, yes. that is electronically controlled and powered by that 48 volt battery. Mm -hmm. And how fast does that thing spin? Up to 70,000 RPM. Then from there, the actual turbocharger, the twin scroll unit, which is larger, and the reason they went to a larger unit is it builds power more linearly, it's more efficient, yada, yada, yada. Right. With all of that, that powers the car. So it's basically a three-step process to get this thing to make 429 horsepower. This is not something you would ever bring to Billy Bob's repair shop and consider having this work done. If you buy this, get a long warranty. I'm not saying it's gonna break, but if it breaks, Forget it. Yeah, pretty much. Forget it. Forget it on this entire car. This has got to be one of the most complicated setups you're ever going to find in a modern car. And the engineering is top notch, right down to the integrated cover. The engine cover obviously reduces noise and vibration, but it also feeds air under here to help cool the side of the motor where the exhaust gas is, the turbocharger. So this is nuts. Let's get it on the road and see how it drives. All right. We are behind the wheel of the E53 AMG.
<laughs> God, it's really aggressive for an old man car. It's like needlessly, like, I feel like they program the shifts, like how can we make it feel as abrupt as possible? And it probably doesn't make it any faster. It just feels fun. Well, that's this car, right? I think it, it does a really good job in feeling more special than it actually is. It feels way faster than it actually is just because how much torque this twin charged motor makes. Yeah, so the way that it accelerates and you know, you find this out pretty quick when you drive it hard like or like we do like jerks. When <laughs> no. you launch it specifically when you switch over to Sport Plus and you leave it in automatic um, and I, I always set the dampers to comfort because what's the point? Uh, you launch it from a start in automatic mode. This thing shifts so hard and it, it feels so fast off the line, but after that, it just feels like every twin turbo type. I mean, it's a big, cylinder. heavy, luxury yes. 2 plus 2. But as far as an experience goes for the buying demographic, the kind of person who's buying this is looking for a car that necessarily feels fast. You know, like right. they're looking for that emotion part of it and that's what this deli delivers on no yeah absolutely and i think one thing that this does extremely well compared to some of the other german cars is there's character in this yes it's loaded full of gimmicks it's it's a a, a product planner's wet dream but you do feel like there's a sense of like spirit or <laughs> personality from the way that it accelerates to the exhaust tone to the transmission performance but the one thing that you definitely can't get, the one thing you can't shake is the dynamics of this in terms of handling. It feels like a big, heavy vehicle. And I, I talked to you right away after I started driving this. The only other car I can compare this to and to the way that it feels if you close your eyes is a Hellcat Challenger. The way that the body moves around, the weight that you feel like you're moving, and it's all in the steering. You never have a sense of nimble, nimbleness from this, so it's a more of a GT car. Since you said that, when we first started driving this, that's all I've been thinking about. The <laughs> steering, specifically, mm -hmm. feels identical. And yes. that's not a bad thing, it's just that's what it feels like. Yeah. So, when you turn off traction control, so the, this thing is all-wheel drive. So you, you always get a sense of control and stability. Even when you just mash on the throttle in a corner or anytime, you never get the sense that the thing's gonna get out of control. And that's something that I felt in like the BMWs, that the car goes much more rear biased, where you can get the car to rotate and move around. And the Mercedes does not do that at all. I mean, you can get the rear to move, but it, it kind of moves in a, like it just wants to rotate but never spin. I definitely think that's more in line with the people who are buying this car though. They, there's this sense of, I don't want to call it, there's this big safety net whenever you're driving yes. this vehicle. But again, it's Ford's target demographic of people who are wealthy, typically older, who are looking for that pimp 2 plus 2 sub $100,000 luxury car. Before we talk about the acceleration, you want to talk more about the suspension tuning and its ride? Yeah, so really you have a multitude of modes. This has a, a front-end lift as a part of air suspension. So if you're going through a drive through or a car wash or a curbing, you can raise it up a little bit, which is really handy for a car like this. Um, the suspension overall, I feel like, you know, basically Comfort and Sport Plus, there's not a huge difference between it. So even when you're in the more aggressive mode, it feels really comfortable. But when you launch it, there's still a lot of body movement in here uh, and it doesn't matter what mode you're in. So you know that, like you said, target demographic, they know that somebody that buys this doesn't want to be beat up by it. Um, and you, you know, obviously there's higher end AMG products where it gets far more stiff than this. This never gets to a stiffness level that is uncomfortable. And that's one of the things I really like about it. It does have a confused sense of character as much as it does have character. Sometimes I'm driving this, I'm like, this feels like a sports car, but when you really start to, to manipulate it and drive it like, you know, more aggressively, it doesn't. Like in automatic mode, it auto up shifts, like when you're turning, um, it's just always feels like it's got more control of the car than you do. This 
I think the name is misleading. Yes, yeah. it's an AMG product, but it's not. To me, an AMG product has a V8, right? The E63 is one of my favorite cars on the current market, period, because the motor is so amazing. This, the inline six in this car, is very impressive. The nine-speed automatic, I think, is very good. I almost thought it was a twin clutch yeah. when I first drove it. It's that good, but the motor, once you get past the noise it makes, feels very generic. It does. It feels very generic. And, you know, if you're going to get this, you definitely want to get the optional exhaust because it's not that much more money. And when you flip it over to Sport Plus, when it opens up the valve in it, with the tuning stuff, it gives you a little bit of fun. And it is a little cheesy. I'll be completely, you know, completely real about that. Yeah, it farts and it, cracks it makes everywhere. The, yeah, it makes the farts and cracks. And it doesn't, it's very synthetic sounding. But again, it's part of the character of this. If you're going to buy this, at least you have the option to act juvenile when you're driving it. But I think the last thing to get into before with the final thoughts is transmission performance. So you kind of brought it up. You can flip it in a manual mode or automatic, and I feel like this car does a much better job in automatic mode. However, it is very responsive to manual shifts. So let's just give you a, a quick look and well, the feel and the sound of it of going through the gears. Final thoughts on the Mercedes E53 AMG. Mercedes knows exactly who this car is for, their target demographic. Someone with some money, and they want flair and prestige. So they've combined a balance of gimmicks on the interior, things that work like great software, and an interesting drivetrain when you add a farty sounding exhaust. And what this gives you over some of the other German competitors is character. And you know you can get over the, combing through all the finer details of the interior space, the engineering, and really it does give you a, a smile on your face when you're driving it more like a like an idiot. It gives you the opportunity to drive like an idiot and and feel like something's happening. It doesn't feel like a video game completely. But I'm going to go over the pros and cons of the car, starting with the interior space. The software for the infotainment and the gauge cluster is some of the best in the industry. However, they have gone and screwed it all up by not understanding how to keep it simple. If they're going to put all this tech in the car, figure out how to simplify the physical inputs, the things that humans need to control all of this without having to menu jump 20 different ways. The next thing that I didn't talk about on the interior is the Burmeister high-end audio, which is $4,500. So I took a lot of time with this and I thought about it far more than I do typical audio systems because it's a lot of money. This should be priced at about $2,500. And I talked to the audio engineer who does, does our testing. All the graphs and charts look phenomenal, but when you sit in the car and listen to it, like I said, Bluetooth does not sound good. Android Auto, in my case, I tried two different phones. I had constant clipping in audio or just distortion in the audio, which leaves you with Apple CarPlay or USB. And what I got was this very strange like noise cancellation effect. There was no mids in certain frequencies. It felt like the mids disappeared, the highs weren't clear. And after talking to the audio engineer, what he had told me is a lot of it is for this car, they cut cost on speakers or the drivers. So the speakers and the doors are not as high end as what you get in the S class. Secondly, they chose the aesthetic design of the way that the door was laid out versus the driver placement. Instead of stacking them vertically, they did a more horizontal layout. What you get is this cancellation effect of the drivers facing themselves. And if you're in the right position in the car, it sounds like you have headphones on. There's just not good stereo separation. So again, definitely opt for the high-end audio, but see if you can negotiate the price. Then all the other gimmicks, like the air freshener, all the tech stuff is you can take it or leave it at the end of the day because it's stuff you're never really going to use. Now the pros are, look at the mechanical engineering, look at the engineering that went into this car, it is unfathomably complicated and amazing at the same time. I'm shocked it works. And when you drive it, 
you don't even know it's there. So it's a testament to what they've done. But this is a lease today, gone tomorrow car. It embodies everything that is cool with today's technology, but in about five years, nobody's gonna care about it. If you are up for a luxury car with all these features, you're gonna love it. If you're somebody that wants more simplicity, you're gonna hate it. Thanks for watching, I'll see you next time.